Uh, welcome to this session of Kaiju Masterclass uh, and this very uh, interesting talk we're going to have with Craig Allen. Uh, you may not have heard of Craig Allen's name, but I think you have probably heard his work if you're a fan of this genre. Uh, Craig is a copywriter, editor, a radio programmer, and most notably uh, to fans of this genre, he's been a voice actor working on the dubbing of a number of films from Asia, including Japanese giant monster films. Uh, Craig lived and worked in Hong Kong for nine years, working for CNN International and also for uh, Omni Productions as a freelance copywriter, an English polisher uh, for faculty at the University of Hong Kong and other gigs. He currently lives in Atlanta. Uh, welcome, Craig. We're really happy to have you here. I'm glad to be here. And uh, thanks for taking time to share uh, your unique experiences from the world of film dubbing, which is something that is really uh, essential and, um, uh, you know, a big part of this genre of film, but something that a lot of people still don't know about. Uh, I'm Steve Reifel. I'm going to hand off the interview here to Matt Parmley, who will be asking the questions. Uh, take it away, gentlemen. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate that. Um, so we're going to jump right into it. Um, so I know that you went to college, I believe, at the University of North Texas. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, your time there and your involvement in their campus radio station? Uh, okay. Uh, when I graduated high school, I thought I was a hotshot musician. So I went to the University of North Texas because it's a giant music school. Uh, within about six weeks, I figured out that I was not a hotshot musician, but I, I hung in there with it. And um, the biggest thing I got out of college was I uh, got involved with the campus radio station, KNTU, and eventually became the uh, program director for it, which is just a student job. Um, that's where I kind of learned. I was going to say, I learned how to use my voice. That sounds kind of silly, but um, I did sort of think about what a voice sounds like on a microphone and things like that. And then that became uh, 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 an entree into uh, the National Public Radio Station in Dallas, K-E-R-A, which I went from college to that station and uh, continued learning how to produce audio and write scripts and things like that. Can you talk a little bit more about what you did specifically for KERA? For KERA, well, uh, I started off just as a part-time um, board operator, like in the middle of the night while they had like satellite programs on. But I eventually became a news announcer. Um, it wasn't much more than just taking copy off of the, the Associated Press wire and filling in during like All Things Considered or that. But uh, from there, I worked my way up. I had a classical music program for a while, and then I started doing a jazz program and then re, re, uh, revamped the format, and it kind of became an eclectic world music, folk music, singer-songwriter kind of a thing. And so I helped uh, develop that format and did radio work on that. I helped produce a, a couple of live performances, but... It was mostly me just kind of standing around making sure nothing nothing caught on fire. It was the actual, you know, engineers who took care of that. So you said um, you thought about how to use your voice for radio. Can you talk about what that actually means? Are you speaking in terms of like voice inflection or like having the radio voice? I sometimes hear people talk about that when they're giving interviews. Uh, yeah, it was just when I first started, you know, speaking maybe just through nerves i guess or just not being trained uh at the campus radio station the um the faculty advisor just kind of came into me one time and said lower your voice come in close to the microphone you know and also in radio you started learning you're talking to one person don't say hey guys where did you know he said no uh, you're talking to one person you're just talking in the ear lower your voice and then when i got into the npr station there's sort of a joke how that's how, how all NPR stations listen. You know, they all talk like this. <laughs> and, and, you know, my program director said, you know, no, don't, don't be stupid about it. But, yeah, keep it kind of lower key. Look, you know, bring the mic in real close. Talk a little bit lower, but don't, 
don't force it or anything like that. And then also I just started learning more and more about how um, speaking to an audience, a, a lot of times you'll hear on like campus radio stations and it's totally natural. You'll hear the, you know, the, the kid on the air say, okay, now here is a public service announcement. And then he reads it. Okay. Now I'm going to read the weather. And then he reads it. You know, it's like, you don't need to, that's you thinking you, the audience doesn't need to know these things. Just do what you're going to do, do the next thing. And also don't make it about you, make it about the music and, you know, keep the show rolling. You're, you're entertaining an audience. It's kind of the, the idea. That's great. Um, so we set the stage for how radio is going to, you know, play into dubbing here in a few minutes, but eventually you end up in Hong Kong. Can you share how you went from the U S to Hong Kong? Well, actually before uh, Hong Kong, I was in mainland China okay. uh, in 1985, just for the fun of it. I got a job teaching or pretending to teach English uh, at a university in China. And back in 1985, this was really early after they'd started opening up to the outside world after being closed off. And so to become a so-called English expert, all I needed to do was have a degree and speak English. So I went there and taught English. Um, fortunately, they had like a book for me to use. If it were just totally up for me to create a curriculum, I would have had no idea what to do. Um, but I loved it. I loved being there. And that's also where I met my first wife, who was a, a Canadian, who was also teaching. Um, after our year in China was up, we both ended up living in Dallas together. And she actually got real credentials for English as a second language. And then after a few years, uh, I was working at KERA. But after a few years, my wife and I just decided, you know what? We want to go back to China. So we did for a second time. That was in like 1992 or three. And we did a couple of years there and we wanted to stay in Asia, but it just wasn't practical to stay in mainland China because we, we weren't making any like actual money that you could spend outside of China. So she got a gig teaching at the university of Hong Kong and I got to tag along and just sort of do whatever I wanted. And so I ended up doing some freelance copywriting and, um, just anything that I could use my English language skills. And then one day I was at the supermarket and there was a bulletin board and just had a little notice up saying native English speakers needed for film dubbing and gave me a phone number to call. And that's what happened. Yeah. So you worked for, uh, from 1995 to 2004, you actually worked for Omni studios. So um, approximately, I think I was actually there probably started with Omni more like 96 or it wasn't right when I got there, but it was like a year later. So, yeah. So you became involved with them basically from a supermarket ad. Is that is that what I just heard? Exactly. <laughs> That's pretty incredible to think about. Do you know, um, was that how they found a lot of their, of their voice talent? Was that the common approach? Uh, yeah. Um, this kind of is throwing back to an earlier time in Hong Kong. This was before the handover to China. And so uh, Brits, any from the UK, could arrive in China, I mean, in Hong Kong, and uh, they were automatically given a work visa. And so there were lots of young, footloose, backpacker Brits or anyone with a British passport there looking for things to do. So um, that's who most of the dubbers were. Um, you know, it wasn't like there was a, they weren't hiring people outside of Hong Kong and bringing them in. It was just whoever happened to be there. So the people I worked with tend to be younger uh, Brits uh, and occasionally also like the wives of uh, American executives who were based in Hong Kong for work and the wives were looking for something to do. There were no husbands. Actually, there was one husband. There was a flight guy who's American guy whose wife was a flight attendant for Cathay Pacific. And that was his visa in Hong Kong and he had nothing to do. So I don't know how they found him, but it was probably on a supermarket bulletin board. Do you know, um, it, it sounds like uh, they didn't really have backgrounds in any sort of, you know, radio, anything like that. Was it was that pretty much true for everybody across the board that you happen to work with? Uh, pretty much. Um, there was one woman, a Scottish woman, who also um, was a singer. So she did singing gigs. Uh, at clubs and stuff in, in Hong Kong. So that kind of, she was a bit of a performer. 
but um, otherwise they were just people who ended up falling into it. Um, everyone had to audition and it, not everyone made it through is um, there's a, there's kind of some skill involved. It's a really weird skill of being able to speak words exactly as you're watching someone say them. Mm -hmm. um, and also there's a lot of pressure when you first start. So there's a lot of people who like auditioned and then said, no, thanks. Not for me. Yeah. Well, I want to expand upon that then because um, what do you remember much about the audition process? And you kind of you mentioned pressure, but where they just like kind of over your shoulder watching you as you're trying to to speak these lines. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, the Omni production was Rick Thomas and Nina Chow and, mm -hmm. and Rick called me in and said, OK, we'll give you cab fare show up at this date and the first day you kind of just stand there and watch how it's done and someone would show you a script and say here's what we're doing here's how it happens and um then they find like one really small part some one-off character has like one line and they say okay here it is that's the line get ready you know and then the film the tape starts rolling and you got to do it and then they give you something a little bit bigger and then also crowd scenes and things like that. And um, it's pretty clear very quickly that some people can do it. And just there were some people who are really smart and great people, but they just it, it wasn't going to happen. So mm -hmm. they, they got let go real fast. Nicely. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 when I say pressure, I mean, everyone was really nice to Rick Thomas, who was kind of in charge of this. He was very kind, very, very positive. But he would also, after a couple of days, kind of say, you know what? I, you know, I, I don't think this is going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. If you want to keep showing up, you can, but you don't have to. Um, so can you share more about who Rick Thomas and Nina Chow were and kind of what uh, the relationship was like with them? Uh, that's a big, big thing to talk about. Rick, uh, was a British guy. He grew up in England, but had, um, joined the special forces in the British army at some point, which when he first told me about this, I thought he was just making stuff up, but actually all the stories ended up being totally consistent. But he then ended up after that, um, being a cop in Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, but was back mm -hmm. then a British colony, and then became a cop in Hong Kong and just stayed there forever. Uh, and he married Ina, who was a local uh, Chinese woman who actually her sister was also involved in the Hong Kong movie business in some way. I'm not quite sure how that worked out. But Rick was a larger than life character. Um, he he kind of dominated the room whenever he walked in. Also, when all the dubbers got together to go drinking or something later, Rick was always the topic of conversation. You know, either he had chewed somebody out or yelled at somebody or said something stupid or did something really generous. And and, and he was a really generous guy, too. He, he could be hard to work with sometimes, but he lent people money. He got them other jobs. He was really generous and was really good to me. So I loved working with him, but sometimes he was a real character. So Omni was Rick and Ina's company, correct? Do you know what the, the working dynamic was between them, like how they landed the, the dubbing jobs that they did and who handled that? I don't know all the details because they actually kind of kept some of it close to the vest. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of kind of secrecy in what they did um, because, and this is a Hong Kong thing, everyone is afraid of someone stealing your clients, mm -hmm. right? But uh, Ina handled uh, the actual negotiations uh, with whoever was, was hiring us. And very often it was the recording studio. The recording studio would have a contract to dub in English a whole bunch of like TV shows or something as a package. And then they would talk to Ina, they talked to Omni about doing that. Occasionally, I am pretty sure Omni had the contract and then they booked the studio so it could either be omni or a studio doing who actually owned the contract and we didn't always know i think all the toho stuff the godzilla movies i think that was omni somehow they had 
a relationship and it was their contract, but I'm not entirely sure. So Ina was kind of the business uh, and Rick was the guy who collected all the dubbers and got them there on time and wrote the checks and paid them. And then Ina would direct in the studio and Rick would dub with us and would crack the whip if we weren't paying attention or make jokes when we were paying attention. So that was kind of Rick's job. So you have a room full of people that are fairly new or novices at doing this whole, you know, dubbing process. What materials were you actually given to prepare? Did you see a script well ahead of time or were you seeing it kind of in real time as you were preparing to do it? Yeah, no, we saw a script when we sat down at the table. Wow. Um, A lot depended on how much the contract was worth, which I have no idea how much any any of these contracts were, but they would tell us, okay, folks, this is a really expensive job and we're going to, we're going to be super careful with it. And it's going to take us three days. Other times it was like, okay, folks, this is a cheap job. We're doing just to make a little bit of money. Uh, We have to do three movies today. Wow. You know, (laughs) so when I say we'd, we wouldn't see the script until we sat down, we would sit down and look at the script. And if it was like a slow, careful job, yeah, we'd look at the scene, read, read through it, try to figure out what was going to happen. And then we do it a little piece by piece. There were some super cheap jobs where it was like, okay, sit down. Here's the script. Three, two, one, go. And you just keep going until someone messes up, back it up a little bit. Three, two, one, go <laughs> like that. So there was no, no rehearsals, no, sending the script out to everyone ahead of time. Nothing like that. Do you know who actually wrote the dialogue in the script? I'm sorry? Do you know who wrote the uh, actual dialogue in the scripts themselves? Um, There were uh, three or four different of the dubbers who did that. I did it like a couple of times and that was one of the worst jobs I ever had. So I, (laughs) I've stopped doing it. The, the fellow who did all the really good work and that includes all the Toho stuff was a, a guy who's both French and British. His name is Martin Patchy, P-A-C-H-Y. I've lost contact with him, but he was an absolutely brilliant scriptwriter because he just did it so much. And so when it comes to script writing, what happens is they give you, back then it was a VHS tape, and then they would give you a, a paper with the subtitles and some often really bad English translations with the subtitles. So you could read the subtitles and what follow along in the VHS. And then it would tell you since it was in Chinese, uh, what it said in English, although it was often really wonky English, but through that you could know, okay, here's what they're saying. And then you watch it and you see how their lips move and how many syllables you have. And so you write English that will have a, the same meaning, but also kind of fit the lips, which that's really challenging. But Martin Patchy just did it in his sleep. It was amazing. Do you know if Toho provided him with um, translations ahead of time? Were they very strict about those translations by chance? Um, I never heard any discussion of, or very much discussion of Toho wanted us to do something different. I think there was a couple of times they made sure we were going to pronounce King Ghidorah the way they wanted it pronounced. Mm. But other than that, they kind of stood back. Um, And in fact, when we were doing uh, Godzilla movies, uh, those would take three or four days to do, which so was a really careful job, Mm. top rate. And, once or twice, you look back in the control room, and there were a bunch of Japanese executives standing back there. And in fact, they would even say, "Okay, everyone, Toho's here. You know, be, you know, behave yourselves." And they would kind of stand there for a couple hours, and then they'd go. So I don't, you know, it wasn't like someone was sitting there monitoring us the whole time. Nothing I'm aware of. Um, and I didn't hear, you know, they never kicked anything back to us to redo or anything like that. But I think there were a couple of soft 
instructions of like, please pronounce it this way. Please. Mm -hmm. You know, that leads me to another question. I know in um, Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla 93 film, uh, in English, they ended up keeping the Japanese pronunciation, which is Radon. Um, typically, we've always said in when, when the film came to the United States, they always called the creature Rodan. Do you know why Radon was kept for this partic- for the, the dub that ultimately made it to the U.S.? I don't know. And that also might be there was I get the, the films kind of mixed up. But there was one that I think you guys have even mentioned of there's this weird dub that no one knows who did it kind of mm-hmm. thing. That might be the one. Yeah, I think uh, it ha- Mecha- Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla has like two dubs, but no one, it seems like it was maybe piecemeal together. Right, okay, two. that's the one. Yeah. So um, I don't remember anything specific about Radon or Rodan or whatever it was. And that was a long time ago. I don't remember what they told us, but that that kind of stuff is actually pretty minimal. There's also a couple of times in the scripts, Martin Patchy wrote, and it's usually like some sort of someone was insulting. It's like, well, I don't care about that damned lizard or reptile. And apparently in Godzilla lore, Godzilla is not a reptile or it's not a lizard or something. And mm-hmm. stuff like that got by. So there was no policing of that unless it was something seriously wrong with it. Yeah, it sounds like Toho was more or less hands off. I mean, do you know if they made sure that... Um, the things that were being said on screen were a pretty literal translation or was there any thought about that? They just wanted to make sure that the lips matched more than anything else. Uh, they wanted to make, make sure the lips matched. And I think they trusted Omni to have a good idiomatic English translation, which, mm-hmm. which it was. Um, I don't know how long Omni had been doing this. I think they had had Godzilla Toho stuff for a decade, even before I got there. So by the time I got there, I think, Toho had a lot of trust that Omni was going to do a good job on it, and they didn't question the English too much. So uh, you mentioned the recording process on the Godzilla film was <clears throat> four days. That was kind of more for your um, prime ticket movies that you were dubbing. Um, if you were sitting there recording three movies in a session, like are you recording for twelve hours? Is it eight hours? Like what's the, how long are you there? Oh for? well. <laughs> Yeah, the three movies a day, that that was a slight exaggeration, although we did that. But that was usually because, okay, folks, we have 80 movies we got to do in a week, you know, because it was somebody. What would happen is um, TV uh, executives from Southeast Asia, and in, in especially Indonesia at the time, would fly into Hong Kong, they'd go to a studio, and they would buy a package of dozens of kung fu films or you know uh costume dramas or something like that and uh in the case of these super cheap ones it really was a a political thing is that in indonesia it was illegal to import anything in chinese language because there was a chinese um uh population there and they tended to be the merchants and kind of had more money and were politically strong and so for better or worse, they decided they didn't, you know, you can produce Chinese things in Indonesia, but they weren't trying to help that particular segment of their population getting stronger. So anyway, they would pick up a whole bunch of Hong Kong movies. And then what our job really was to do was just cover the Chinese with English. And then they were going to put their own subtitles on it. So for that, they did not care how well we did it. And they were and they were paying they were paying very little for this. So it was like, all right, if that's what you want, here we go. And so we would race through those as fast as possible. And you know, if, if someone really blew a line or we got you know got lost or something like that, yes, we'd stop and back it up. So some of those were 12 hour days. Hmm. In fact, I the biggest paycheck I ever had in my life was we did a month of like 12 hour days of just cranking through these things as fast as possible. And we were all exhausted at the end of it, but that's that's what the contract was. Uh, the Godzilla movies, it would be an eight-hour day, generally. Uh, I think on a couple of them, I remember we kind of got behind schedule for whatever reason. So uh, a couple of people had to, who had more parts or more lines to do. One time I got had to stay until like 10 o'clock one night because we were trying to wrap it up that day. 
but normally it'd be about an eight hour day, something like that. Um, can you talk about the dubbing process itself? I mean, I'm not sure that the Kaiju Masterclass fans watching this would really have a grasp on um, what technology was used, how it was set up, what the room looked like, what the microphone positioning was. Could you elaborate uh, on that for us? Um, well, for, I'll tell you, there's, there were, at the time, two different types of dubbing. Uh, the big Toho ones were, were looped, which was yeah. actually done on film. And that was actually fairly rare for us. And I'll, I don't know the industry now, but I doubt no one loops anymore. This is really time consuming. But anyway, what is, uh, what is looping exactly? Well, looping was, uh, in this case, Ina Chow would go in a week early and they'd take the film, they'd sit with a technician, and they would literally chop it up into loops of film that were anywhere from like 20 seconds to up to a minute. And then, when we dubbed it, they put the loop on and Ina had a script, but also like a code, like, okay, this is loop number 37 a or something like that. And they'd run the loop. The hard part about looping is if it's 30 seconds long and you blow a line, you got to wait for the loop to go all the way through and come back again. And then you do it again. And if you mess it up again, the loop has to go all the way through and come back again. Um, if it's just one person talking, some easy easy lines, it's great. Sometimes, though, they're really complicated, like six different people jumping in and talking over each other. And um, some of those, it could take us 10, 20 minutes to get that loop done perfectly. So that was the old-fashioned way. Normally, what we did, and I think is probably what the industry does now, is we did it on tape. And they could... we. We sit in a room, there's a microphone. This, it was the same for looping. You sit at like a little desk with a microphone and they can show it to you. But this, we had a, like a TV monitor and then they would just kind of, normally it would sort of just roll. Okay, here's the, we're going to do this next 20 seconds or this next scene. So we'd look at it, practice our lines, everyone. And we'd all kind of, cry. if there were three characters, there were three people in there all talking on the same microphone. And we'd all kind of, check out what we're going to do and how it ended and stuff like that. And then they'd roll it back up and we try to do it. And then if someone screwed up, you just stopped there, rolled it back 10 seconds, take another shot at it. Do you know how big the cast were typically? Like, were you voicing multiple characters? throughout? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, I mean, you had to be, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, they kept it to where the, the, principal characters were kept consistent with an actor. But everyone then would pick up one or two other minor characters, maybe, or just one off. And then um, some people, that's all they did all day was just, okay, you're, you're, but you're the butler. Okay. Now you're the cop now. Okay. Now and um, we change our voices up a little bit uh, and not to be, you know, not to a ridiculous extent, um, but actually when you play it back, you know, visually you see this new character come in, he's got a different face, he's wearing different clothes and his voice sounds different because you, all the clues are, this is a different character. Um, so we would pitch our voice up a little bit, pitch our voice down a little bit, maybe an accent or something. And it generally worked. Now, there were some where, yeah, we had five people dubbing an entire movie. And after a while, it's like, we've run out of voice. <laughs> but those were the really, those were the super cheap ones where they were trying to do it for as cheaply as possible. Were there any um, specific films that you remember that were maybe more difficult to dub than others? Um, not, not really. Uh, um, we it just depended on kind of how chaotic the movie was, so I can't remember any specific titles. But sometimes we did some old uh, Hong Kong kung fu movies, mm. where holy cow, there was just stuff going on all the time, and people jumping in, and people jumping out, and and uh, gangsters and cops, and and then the fight scenes. We'd have to do all the fight scenes, uh, so those could get kind of difficult. 
And then on the other hand, stuff like some of the Toho movies, it wasn't a movie in particular, particular, but we were trying to be so careful and get it just right that if there was a scene that had like six people in it, that could be really tedious because like I said, one person gets, you know, flubs his line or is a little bit late or a little bit early. He's like, eh, stop, back up, got to do it again. And then, you know, when I was in those, I was like, I don't want to be the one who screws it up. I don't want to be the one who's screwed <laughs> And if somebody else screwed it up, it was like, ah, not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you mentioned some of the Hong Kong Kung Fu movies. Um, I mean, during the 80s and the late 80s, early 90s, you had like John Woo and uh, uh, Sui Hark and, and you know, Once Upon a Time, uh, Once Upon a Time in China, geez. Um, but you had a bunch of people making these, you know, a bunch of well-known directors making these movies that are now considered classics. By the time that you had arrived there, the industry was kind of in its decline. But did you have any exposure at all to the actual film, film studios? And was there any opportunity to work there, uh, either as a maybe a dubber or even like for like CNN at all? Um, well, uh, one thing I want to make sure is when I say the, the industry was in decline, I'm mostly speaking of the English dubbing industry. I mean, Hong Kong mm -hmm. films are still being made. Yep. But um, most of the dubbing work for English language was going like to Vancouver and because you could, you could FTP, you could send over the internet, the script and the film and everything, and they could do it there and send it back. Whereas the kind of dubbing I did was born in the day where you had to be in Hong Kong and you had to have some native speakers right there to do it. So that was what I mean by in decline. Um, but uh, I did happen to work on, um, there were a few, this wasn't for Omni, but I did like, uh, was Infernal Affairs, which was a very famous uh, Hong Kong movie. Uh, I dubbed one character on that. And that was at some big studio. I don't remember which. Um, and so we didn't, yeah, I, I did one job like on the Shaw Brothers. Yeah. Uh, uh, on their property one time, but it was nothing exciting. I just went in and there was a studio next to the gate. I went into a studio. It looked like a studio. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like I got to wander around through a back lot or saw people walking around in costumes and things like that. So no, we didn't really have that much uh, contact with the actual Hong Kong film industry. The, the one we all really admire. Most of what I was doing for Hong Kong was older films that were being redubbed. Um, there was one studio we worked in, uh, it was called Clearwater Bay Studios, um, which did have a back lot. And I actually got to walk through the back lot a couple of times. Um, but there was just a big Kwanzaa Hut studio that we did some work there. And that was always fun to work there. That and Shaw Brothers, they were both located um, in an area called Clearwater Bay. And when they first started, there was nothing there. It was totally forested and rural. And so um, their back lot would back up on, you could see the, the bay down below it. Uh, and also there was a, va a, a lovely verdant valley down below it. But then development started coming in there and it ruined all those shots. So um, that they stopped using it. It was the same with Shaw Brothers. My daughter's school was literally across the street from the Shaw Brothers studio. And you could see way up on a cliff, you know, you couldn't see exactly what was going on, but you could see there were sets up there. And I am sure they were shooting dramatic shots with this big blue bay back behind it. Um, but I think even those are starting to get messed up because I think there were ships starting to come into that part of the bay. And so, like I said, a lot of what I did was sort of years after the heyday of this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good segue. I know um, in 1997, there is a significant financial crisis that basically hits Asia. Can you kind of tell us what happened and how that impacted Hong Kong and specifically your work in dubbing? Uh, yeah, um, our work dried up. Like overnight, mm. we suddenly had very little work to do. Um, and um, we, for, 
one of the other contracts we had been working on at that time was um, I, I don't remember which Japanese uh, broadcaster had set this up, but we were doing hours and hours and hours of Japanese cartoons and mystery stories and things like that. And um, our understanding was it was going to be on a satellite, all Japan television that was going to be aimed at all of Asia. And then the moment the financial crisis hit, we stopped doing that. I am certain that that uh, satellite channel never got off the ground. So just everything just kind of came to a halt. And what work we did have was really cheap. And uh, Rick Thomas kept telling us we were doing a lot of these cheap ones just to kind of keep the team together. But he, well, he always claimed they weren't making any money off of it. Uh, take that with a grain of salt. But yes, it it was really bad for our business. And um, also just the, the whole economy for Asia just collapsed. So at that time, Thailand was on the way up. Indonesia was on the way up. Malaysia was becoming more, much more prosperous which was going to be good for our business. And then suddenly it all stopped. Yeah. Um, it's my understanding that a lot of the stuff that you had worked on, maybe never saw, like never broadcast, never published, never released or any of that. Is that something that you know any information about? Do you think any of the work that you had done just kind of disappeared because of that? Well, I'm sure all of this Japanese stuff we did hmm. is probably in a vault somewhere or maybe not even in a vault anymore. Hmm. Um, and then a lot of that stuff I said, the cheap stuff we did for Indonesia, I have no idea. You know, they probably showed it once or twice on TV. I don't know. But, it, it you know, earlier before this, you were asking me, tell me some of the things you could have done, you've done. And I can tell you a bunch of stuff, but if you're going to go look it up or something like that, it doesn't exist anymore other than these Toho things, which is sad for me, but it was still a fun job. But that's also that's kind of what I you know people need to understand that in the English dubbing industry, it was already in decline. All the really big fancy stuff that is still on a DVD or something was probably done in Canada at that time. Do you and, remember the last um, film that you actually had worked on? Because you lost uh, it in two thousand four, right? Yeah. Man, I have no idea. I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> that's okay. Um, so there was one other question I meant to ask when I brought up the, the radon radon bit, um, Godzilla versus destroyer or AKA Godzilla versus destroyer, which, um, was Toho super picky about how that name was pronounced because that's been kind of a, a debate amongst fans. Like, why do they go with destroyer? But they spell it. So, you know, phonetically with, uh, this O R O Y A H thing but the dub is more destroyer. Was that a Toho decision or was that just something that came out of the, the, the dubbing process naturally? Uh, I was, I, I was not really aware of this controversy, but um, I'm going to take a guess at that. Um, a couple of our dubbers were British, but they were supposed to affect an American accent. And sometimes it was pretty good. And sometimes it wasn't that good, and saying destroy up is hard for some reason hard for someone from the UK, and so they they, they put R's on the end of lots of things. Mm -hmm. So it was probably entirely possible that was just someone's accent turning into d destroyer. Um, but I don't know. I, like I said, I don't remember getting any instructions to me passed on from Toho. It happened occasionally, but it was I don't remember that being a particular thing. They, maybe maybe they did say tell us to say destroyer, but I don't remember actually how we dubbed that. Okay, they all run together in my mind. So I know um, around the time that uh, Mighty Peking Man was released in the U.S., you actually helped our very own Steve Rifle uh, interview uh, Ho Ming Wah, and I'm sure I'm butchering that name, so apologies in advance for that. Um, but can you tell us kind of about that experience? I mean, you had to actually go in person, do the interview, and he's the director of the of the film Mighty Peking Man, of course. Uh, yeah, Steve and I had hooked up online talking about Godzilla at some point. And then out of, I was still living in Hong Kong at the time. And out of the blue, he said, hey, there's this director. He doesn't speak English. He only speaks Mandarin. Do you want to interview him? 
And I had been studying Mandarin for many years. And I was okay at speaking Mandarin, but I had never interviewed anybody in it, but, um, you know, didn't want to say no to anything, so I did it. Um, he was a lovely el older gentleman, and I talked to him on the phone. And he's, and when we were going to figure out where to meet, he said, yeah, let's meet at, uh, this is a common place to meet, at the Tim Sa Choi uh, uh, MTR station, the subway station. And then I'll take you, he said to me, I'll take you to where I like to hang out with my friends. And I was going, oh, my God, this is going to be so cool. Because around there, there are these very famous tea houses where old men take, like, their birds. They, they have, like, songbirds, and they carry them to the tea house and set them up and let the birds sing. And then these old Chinese guys drink tea and smoke cigarettes. And I was going, oh, my God, this is going to be so awesome. I can't wait. And so I met him at the NTR station uh, and we walked a couple of blocks to a KFC. <laughs> that, oh, yeah, KFC, awesome. <laughs> that had to be a disappointment. <laughs> it was. But anyway, I carried. I had a tape recorder with me, and uh, I was being as brave as I could speaking Chinese. I did all right. Um, he was very patient with me with my Chinese, and then fortunately, he also talked. In other words, I'd ask him a question, he'd do it. So I recorded it so that I... You know, I could follow along what he's doing and do follow-up questions. But if you really wanted me to write up what the interview was, I needed to go back and listen to the tape. But I, I got through it. It was uh, one of my triumphs in speaking a foreign language. I couldn't do it today. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. Um, so I have just a, a few more questions as we kind of close out. I want to go back to something that you mentioned earlier, which is I know that you wrote a few scripts and you said it was kind of one of the worst things that you had done. But what was... What was so hard about that process exactly? Um, well, it's kind of an acquired skill, but you have to sit in a room with the VHS and and the the paper script the, with the subtitles and all, and then you play it and you go, okay, how can I? How many syllable? How do I make a sentence that fits that? Blah 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 blah. blah. Yeah, okay, that fits. So you type it, and then you have to do the next line, and then it. I wasn't that skillful at quickly coming up. Here's how I can fill those those lips and I did only three and it was laborious. It took me hours and hours to the point where it wasn't really even financially in my favor. In other words, they, they were going to pay me uh, a flat fee for doing it. And that would have been great if I can just buzz right through it, but it just took me so long and it's so tedious. And it's one of those jobs where you like take a job and go, Okay, I'll, it sounds hard, but I'll do the job. And about halfway through, you're going, why did I take this job? Oh, my God, please, someone take this away from me. So so I did three. And after that, I said, man, no thanks. <laughs> Not for me. <laughs> um, so as kind of the, our final question, um, were there any characters or performances or maybe movies that you rec that you – think fondly of that might have been your favorite that you, you know you could kind of point people to and say hey that was me this is what i sounded like when i when i did the dub uh most of the uh toho stuff um i had an i was one of the older dubbers and i kind of had an older voice so in fact most of the stuff i did on the godzillas were the the disgruntled general in the big war room mm or some older scientist who's warning that this is going to be a catastrophe, things like that. And a lot of the mostly smaller characters, but there was one film and I, you're going to have to help me remember which one it was. I think it was Godzilla versus Mecha Godzilla where Mecha Godzilla was this giant robotic Godzilla aircraft. And there was this old grizzled pilot who was living on Godzilla's Island uh, Space Godzilla, probably. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And I was the old grizzled pilot. And I, so it was the biggest part I had. And it was a blast. So that's the one. If I, I have the DVD. If anyone wants to hear me dubbing, that's the one I pull out. And so that's the one I have the fondest memories of. That's the one where I can really say, oh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> and occasionally wow. I'll be watching like on um, cable TV or something like on sci fi. They'll have an old Godzilla. And I'll go, Hey, 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 that's that's Henry. Oh, I'm I, that's oh, we did that right. And then it's like, is that me? 
oh my gosh, that's me. So, is it weird to hear your voice? You know, looking back all these years, is it weird to hear yourself in those movies? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's really weird. <laughs> but also, uh, you know, when I started dubbing, it was mm -hmm. just like it. You know, we said off of a bulletin board, and we were doing kind of cheesy Hong Kong films and things like that. And then one day, Ina said, oh, next week we're doing a Godzilla movie. And it was like, what a Godzilla movie? Oh, my God. You know, this. Okay, I've done it. Bucket list. That's it. You know? Well, I meant to ask you, actually, was one of my first questions, and somehow I got <laughs> a little sidetracked. But um, what was your experience with Godzilla prior to, like, becoming involved with the dubbing process? Saturday afternoon TV. I loved the old Japanese movie. I loved Godzilla and Mothra and all that. I, I, I'm not a fanatic the way a lot of people are, but I knew Godzilla and I thought they were the coolest movies ever. And so, yeah, when suddenly, just out of the blue, said, "Oh, by the way, you're going to be dubbing a Godzilla movie." It was like, "Holy cow, this is awesome!" That's and cool. indeed, they did like one a year every year, and it was always my favorite thing to do. Well, I think it's great. I mean, the. Um, an anecdote from, for me is that, you know, my son is seven and when we watch Godzilla, we, we still watch them dubbed and it's how I grew up with the movies. It's how he's growing up with the movies. So, um, I think fans have a great appreciation for the work that you've done. And so thank you so much for coming on Kaiju Masterclass and sharing all these wonderful stories. I really appreciate it. Um, any closing comments or thoughts that you want to share? Maybe even, um, if people want to reach out to you as a way that they could possibly get a hold of you. Uh, well, I'm really pleased you asked me to be here. It's one of those things I kind of like it. Why is anyone interested in this? But I guess so. But yeah, um, reach out to me. Uh, I guess you could find me at Joe Tofu, J O E T O F U, at yahoo.com, which was actually the email address. That was your screen name, right? Was that like the title that sometimes you would appear in the credits? Or am I? No, no. Oh, my name doesn't appear in any credits. We're yeah. Tofus. We don't exist. <laughs> But long, long ago, where Steve first found me, I was on some sort of online forum, and I asked Joe Tofu, and I just mentioned, hey, I dubbed these. And, of course, everyone on the forum thought I was lying. Mm, okay. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, why would I lie about that? But anyway, and that's how Steve first found me. No, thank you. It's been a, a real pleasure. And, 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 again, like, just for your benefit, this is how a lot of fans grow up with, with these films. It's the most accessible way that you can present them to the, in, you know, in the West. And um, I really appreciate the the work that was done for these movies. And again, I know like for me, it's really cool to watch my son see these movies the first time and he can watch them and comprehend, you know, what's actually going on because obviously he's not going to be able to read subtitles. So for real, thank you. I, I really, I, I do appreciate that. Well, this is a real pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks, Craig. Um, well, thank you to all watching Kaiju Masterclass. That brings this session to an end. Um, please stay tuned for the next session, which should start uh, more momentarily. Thank you.